You're listening to Witch Wednesdays, your weekly podcast source for all things witchcraft in the modern world. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and I have a special guest with me today um, to do a fun little interview. And I think that she's going to be able to answer a lot of questions that uh, just came up in the survey that I had for 2022. So I'm very excited uh, to to have a little chat today and have her share everything that she has to offer with you. So I am, first of all, going to let her introduce herself and tell you about all of the different places that you can find her online. Hi, I'm Asada De La Cruz. I am Cottage Core Rising everywhere online on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, even though I swore it would never happen. Um, <laughs> and everywhere is Cottage Core. And then my website is cottagecorerising.com. I will have everything linked over at whichwednesdays.com just to make it a little easier for you to find. But yeah, that's definitely easy that you have like the same username <laughs> yeah. across across everything. So to get started, why don't I just ask you what, um, what it is that you offer? Because you have a shop, you have services, you offer a lot in terms of spirituality. Okay. Um, well, everything links back to holistic motherhood. Um, like I am the mama of a two-year-old. You can definitely hear in the background because she's very <laughs> feral. Um, and so, so for me, I wanted to provide wellness for mamas in a way that encompasses us physically, spiritually, like everything all across the board, because I just when I first became a mother, like I realized that there was nowhere, like people either forget that we're spiritual beings or forget, like there's never anything that encompasses all of that. So that was the inspiration behind everything that I offer. Um, So my services are for everyone, but my main focus is motherhood. So physically I offer things in my shop where I have an apothecary. And so I, um, I make tinctures and herbal extracts and like sell actual um, herbs and stuff that I grow myself. Um, I also offer yoga classes and then specifically for motherhood, I um, am a birth worker. So I do birth doula services, postpartum doula services, breastfeeding counseling, childbirth education, like everything in that realm. And then spiritually, I um, do tarot readings, oracle readings, and spiritual consultations. My gosh, yeah. So you definitely offer a lot, which means you are one heck of a busy mama. (laughs) And that is something I can't even tell you how many times that came up on the survey that I sent out to see what people wanted to hear about in 2022. And one of the things that came up so many times is how do I be a parent and also have like a sense of self? How do I incorporate any of my spiritual witchcraft, anything practice into what I'm doing when I'm so um, all consumed with being a parent? So do you have any advice to, to tell people? Because I am not a parent. I am only a dog mom. So I have no um, answers to offer anybody. (laughs) Um, Well, I mean, I started off as a cat mama. So, I mean, that was really good training for like my (laughs) feral human child that I have now. Um, (laughs) But, oh gosh, in terms of advice, I don't like to give advice, but I'll tell you what I did. And for people not to do that, um, I (laughs) became very, very consumed with motherhood. I feel Um, and it's something that I feel very strongly about still. I feel like it's a calling in my life and I feel like it really was what I was put on this earth to be was a mother. Um, but at the same time, I am just now learning now, (laughs) like one of my big goals for this year is to realize that like, I can't give from an empty cup. (laughs) And so, especially in terms of like spirituality that I have to make sure I'm carving out that time for myself because for one thing, like I have these little eyes that are on me. So if my daughter Dahlia sees me always stressed out, always giving everything to her, never see me doing like my own personal prayers or my own personal ceremonies or whatever, she's not going to have a concept of like that spirituality for herself. So that's something that I have tried to be very, very conscious of now is knowing that like she's watching me and I want to set this example of what this is supposed to look like. Um, so for me, I've had to 
also, I think a big part of that is recognizing that things are going to look a little different in terms of like your personal practice when you become a mama, especially during those early years. Like I said, my daughter's two. So I don't have an hour each day to do yoga and then go for a walk by myself and like all these things. Like sometimes it's like, hey, I got 10 minutes. I can either shower or I can do yoga or I can just lay on the floor and take a nap. So like (laughs) I have to recognize that like I just have to make I just recognize that this is just for a season and that I may have to like change based on those seasons. So right now what things look like for me is a lot of my like daily rituals I do do with my daughter. So we get up together in the mornings and the first thing we do is we go to like our ancestral altar and she helps me light the candle. She helps me put in resin. She helps me like put fresh flowers on. She loves to, (laughs) what's really funny, I just posted this um, on social media yesterday. Um, I went to, well, no, it was on New Year's. I went to, because we put food on our altar and I guess she's seen me do that so much and she's never actually done that part herself. And so I came back later to like, put new food out and I saw where she put like this fake meat and cheese from her little toy kitchen like on a little plate (laughs) and sat it on the altar (laughs) and it was the sweetest thing ever and so it's that was one of my moments of like realizing that okay I'm doing this right like she is watching she gets what's going on um So it's a very long-winded way of saying that I try to incorporate her into much as possible um, so she can see and start getting this practice on her own. But then I also, like for me, once she goes down for a nap or when she goes to bed at night, that's when I make sure that I take 30 minutes for myself a day. Like sometimes it's split up with 15 during nap time, 15 at night, like whichever, where like I read from like anything that like I consider like scriptures or I try to have prayer time or I try to journal or I try to get yoga in or whatever um but I just take that 30 minutes to do some sort of like private practice by myself so I can fill my own cup sorry I feel like that was a very long-winded answer (laughs) (laughs) no that that was perfect because I think uh so many people you know parents are not have that issue where we're so busy and it seems like spirituality is so detached from everything else that we do that a lot of people don't realize that you can incorporate it all together and make that just a part of every day where you can fit it in. Even if it's, you know, small pockets of time, it really does all blend together. I think it's so important for me. Like I grew up with religion and spirituality being so infused in every single part of our everyday for everything and like I love that and like I grew up Catholic and though that's not my spirit I don't know I say I'm Catholic-ish um so like it's not fully my practice and stuff anymore that was something that like I love from that is that like we had prayers for everything like everything like went back to like having God and spirituality be like the main focus of our lives and so that's something I try to do now so it's not a matter of like on holidays or like the certain part of the day, like this is the only time we can do this. Like from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, like we're in constant prayer and constant ceremony and all these things. So it's just infused in everything. I think that's also a really interesting perspective to share that I think my listeners have had questions about because I have mentioned this before that I was raised Catholic as well. Mm -hmm. And I have totally left that. (laughs) That is not, um, you know, part of my life anymore and not what I believe in. So a lot of people who have remained in, you know, Christianity or any other of the two um, Abrahamic religions have asked me, you know, how do I balance that? Um, And yeah, I just sort of left that. So it's really interesting that you still uh, incorporate what you were raised in um, into how you practice now. I think because my cultural identity is such a huge part of my life. Um, And so for my family, um, because my family is Yoruba and Shata. Um, And so with the Yoruba side of my family, when we were captured and brought here like as slaves, so much of our faith and our spirituality had to be like hidden within Catholicism. (laughs) So like everything we do is still so, um, like it's so infused together. Um, So it's hard for me to separate it um, as much as like I've tried to. Um, I, I have no ties whatsoever to the Roman Catholic church. 
I just, it is what it is. <laughs> I feel like I don't, I don't Fair want enough. anything to do with that, like at all. Um, I am fortunate. I did have my daughter baptized within the church, like as this family tradition, as something that, I mean, I kind of regret it. It's whatever. But within like, so when I say Catholic-ish and Catholicism, for me, it's more of like the cultural practices that my family had to use in order to like stay alive essentially and not be killed for like practicing their faith so more so than yeah like I'm not like a pope catholic I'm more like a Marie Laveau type catholic (laughs) (laughs) which is that something that you know your ancestors taught you were you raised in a similar way that you're raising your daughter or have you started up new practices with her yes and no um we uh, it's so weird. It's one of those things where my family, they grew up with like the Christian label, but everything we did was so witchy. And it's like now <laughs> as an adult, I'm just like, I just teach my like, I'm going to call it what it is. Um, so it was like, so my family did all these things and I grew up with all these traditions and like all these things, but we always called it something else. And I think a lot of it, it does like it kind it came from that fear of like as um African slaves like from Yoruba we if we were caught like practicing these things and calling it what it was like they would be murdered and killed and so that mindset is something that's still carried on to like each generation so like my grandmother is still today is like so scared that I'm so open (laughs) about like my beliefs and what I do and stuff but it's something where I want my daughter to be proud of it. I don't want her to have any shame in like what she believes in, rather it be politics or culture, religion, or like whatever. Like, I just want her to have pride in it. So I have to have that same pride. Yeah. And that's beautiful because you already know that she's copying everything. Everything. (laughs) Exactly. And I think for me, I, I like, if I were to like psychoanalyze myself now, I think I held so much shame for so long and tried to fit into so many like Eurocentric type boxes and stuff because I had shame in like who I was because growing up, like that wasn't something that like we were proud of and stuff. So I think it's taken me a really, really long time to get to this point. And I don't want my daughter to go through a lot of the like shame and who she is um, that I did. Did you, how can I wear this? Did you do any like quote unquote shadow work to work through that? Did you incorporate your spirituality and witchcraft into, you know, healing from that sort of ideas that you held about this shame? I'm still doing shadow work. <laughs> like, it is like, it never I'm, ends. <laughs> I'm like, let me do this for the rest of my life. And then, like, um, but yeah, shadow work was a, a big, huge part of that. And that was something that, this all really, really began for me when I found out I was pregnant with um, my daughter. So about three years ago, um, because I just, I knew that my family did the best they could with what they were given. And so now I feel like you have a responsibility when you know better, you do better. And so I was like, I don't want her to like have any of the shame. So like, I have to work on that within myself and, and figure out the root cause of it and have a lot of tough conversations with my family. And so far, I mean, like, it's been really good. And I I love that my family has been very open to learning and growing and stuff like with us. So it's, it's been, I've been super grateful. (laughs) Yeah. That's, it's nice to have that support. Yeah. Which you know, it is tough because when you're you know, changing from what people have done in the past, that can be incredibly difficult for your family and friends to accept. Mm-hmm. So, and, you know, not always be so supportive. So it's really nice that you have people who could support you on that journey. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, that's not to say that my granny doesn't like sprinkle holy water on us before we like come in, like, because she's <laughs> so, so afraid, but like my mom's been really great and stuff. So my siblings are great. So. Oh, that is, yeah, that is really nice. So what then let's talk about, you know, daily life, obviously with 
a two-year-old. There is no such thing as a traditional day or a perfect day or anything. Um, you know, her mood, I'm sure, changes by the every 10 minutes. So it oh, yeah. would be hard to say. But what are a couple of things that you like to incorporate in your daily practice? I said, I know you mentioned that you do you know, your, your reading in your me time in those 15 minute pockets, but is there anything else like daily tarot readings or working on your herbs as part of your business? What is it that you do day to day? Um, day to day, like first off, like I said, our very first thing, we always start off with our altar. Um, like I just, I feel very strongly about like starting off your day and like prayer and gratitude. So before we do anything, that's the first thing we do is come downstairs to that. And then, um, depending on her mood <laughs> is what we do <laughs> next. Um, like sometimes like I am super, super grateful that we still like live like on our family's land. Um, so our, our family, there's an area where like I'm from is called Africa town. And it's where the last slave ship ever to come to the U S is where it landed. And after, um, the slaves were let free, they all settled in that same area and like built their lives and their families and stuff there. And so that's where my family still lives. Um, so like, so we have that. And then also like the Shata side of me, like the reservation is like 30 minutes from our house. So like we, so each day we try to do something like with the land, like Daya loves like going for walks and like picking up rocks and like talking to trees and like <laughs> all of these things. So like, usually like that's kind of the next thing we do. And like, we've kind of turned it into like these prayers slash like gratitude walks um where like I'm talking to her about like and we're singing like traditional songs and I'm telling her about like or she's telling me usually that like God made the trees or God every time something passed she's like God made that and sometimes like "Mm, not so much (laughs) but (laughs) like so it's been really nice so we do things like that um and that's again one of those things that I was mentioning about how recognizing that in this season of my life, my spirituality is going to look a lot different than it did in years. And it was just me by myself. Like I would have never thought like going for a walk was this like great spiritual experience like each day, but like it is. Um, And so then after that, like we usually, I carve a certain amount of time each day where I am actually working on like fulfilling orders and like answering emails and things like that. And so like during that time, I usually give her like her free play time. And that's when I'm able to get like my computer work type done. But then other than that, like she is helping me with everything else. So like, actually when I'm like making tinctures, like she is learning how to do it. (laughs) Like she loves each day going to like my herbal extracts and like shaking them up. That's like the highlight of it um, (laughs) for her. And she helps me like actually pull things from the garden. She's learning how to like dry herbs herself. So like she is very, very involved in like everything that I do with the business. Um, The only thing that I like, I mean, if I'm doing like readings and stuff for clients, like I usually try not to have her involved in that because I feel like she is very susceptible to things. And so like I try to like protect her in like that regard. Um, but other than that, like every single thing I do every day, like she's right there. <laughs> yeah. I've seen the pictures on your Instagram. She's super sweet. <laughs> like always involved in everything. It's adorable. <laughs> <They're talking about me. laughs> she's like, I know. I'm like, oh. <laughs> she just like looked up and was like me. <laughs> you mean me. I heard the word adorable. You must mean me. <laughs> So if somebody wanted to um, book something with you, let's start with virtual. I know they have a lot of options between yoga, tarot readings, herbal consultations. What is their first step to head over to your website? Yeah, head over to the website um, for anything that's not, I mean, like tarot and oracle readings, you can just book straight out but like anything deeper like I always ask people to book a consultation first so like we can talk through it and figure out like what it is that you need and if it is something that I can provide or if it's something that I don't do or whatever um so those are available on the website as well to book a consultation that is great and you also offer so spiritual consultations which Mm -hmm. Is that something, because I know that a lot of listeners are going to like jump on that, that they're going to want to know more. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So for your spiritual consultations, do they have to have, you know, the same sort of mindset or spiritual background that you do, or can anybody jump in on that? No, anybody can jump in on it. It's just whatever I offer is going to be from my practice though. Um, so like it would be from like Yoruba or Shaka traditions, but yeah, if anyone like wants any guidance in that regard or any like spiritual work from that regard, then yeah, yeah absolutely. So would like you say it. that anything that you do or offer is part of a closed practice or closed religion? Because I know a lot of people want, don't want to step on any toes in that regard if they weren't raised in the same traditions that you were. The things that I do that are part of a closed practice, I don't offer it as a service. So anything that I offer as a service is something that I can share. Or let me take that back. There may be certain things within like the spiritual work that I can do for someone else, but I can't really explain it to you. And I can't really tell you like what it is that I'm doing. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. But as a whole, like I am, I mean, because a huge part of yeah. me starting Cottage Core Rising was that I wanted to be able to educate people um, because I was lacking so much of that yeah. information growing up. Um, and then also just in like the grander sense, like I know I mentioned this to you when I first reached out to you is that I feel like there's just such a void of black and indigenous spirituality within like the witchy world <laughs> that people don't understand it they don't know what's going on they don't and there's just this lack of representation and people not understanding what we do and like some of it is because a lot of it is closed practice and then some of it is just because there's no representation of us to like to share these things so like yeah for the most like I am so super, super big on education and explaining to people like what it is that I do. Yeah, which is great that come up, that came up in the survey a lot about representation and um, how to find, you know, witches or spiritual practitioners that are of like the same background or similar background. And you're right, it is a widely underrepresented, underrepresented community. Um, I, mean, I spent within. so long like wondering if because when I first decided that I was going to really explore this and like stop kind of hiding under like the Catholic lens and like really like push myself like witchy wise like I let me tell you I spent so long trying to like be this like Celtic Wiccan because like I thought that was all there was like within the witchy world and like even like in my local community that's all everybody was and so I was like oh my gosh this is and it's like it's so embarrassing stuff to like say it but for the longest I was like calling myself Athena Ravenfire that was my name for like the longest time and this was like very very young like high <laughs> but like because I was just like oh because I read like one silver raven wolf book and I was like this is it like and so I just I never saw anyone that looked like me I never saw anyone like that practiced the way that I practiced outside of like my immediate family and so I want so many other like young girls out there to know that they don't have to like Celtic Wicca isn't the only thing isn't the like, only option the right yeah <laughs> It, and it definitely can seem that way. I think that is, I think Celtic and uh, Norse paganism right now yes. are like two of the most popular and obviously they are very, very whitewashed, like very, so, mm -hmm. like even, even by, you know, American standards and trying to make that, you know, more westernized, it is just uh, yeah. so overrepresented that it seems like those are like the only two options, mm -hmm. um, which can be incredibly detrimental to, you know, spiritual growth and just being accepting of a wider community in general. Like those are two great practices and they are beautiful, you know, right. spiritualities in and of themselves, but they are not the only options. And I know that it can seem that way when you are a beginner, witch or just starting out on a new spiritual path from what your um, parents practiced. Right. Definitely not the only option. So I love that you're you're out there and that you are so open with your practice and you're willing to educate. Um, I think that is just a beautiful sort of service to offer and, you know, showing your family on Instagram and just how 
um, differently that you do things, but um, are still <laughs> being a little more true to your culture than uh, Celtic Wiccanism. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that is beautiful. So if you have any, you know, last advice that you would give to someone maybe in the same position that you were in while you were in high school, what is it that you would tell them? Hmm. I think the first main thing is, I think it is very important for you to figure out a way to honor your ancestors. And I think once you start with that is when like all the doors will start to open for you. When I, it wasn't until like I started doing like daily ancestor veneration and really developing a relationship with my ancestors that like I started having things revealed to me. I started finding teachers, like family members, like started appearing to me and like becoming a part of my life and like teaching me ceremonies and teaching me traditions that I've forgotten about. And I feel like all those things were blessings for me actually deciding to honor my ancestors. So I think it's really important to always like start there with your ancestors. And that's such a like, it's such a traditional thing and people feel like it's not important and it's not necessary and stuff today, but like it is, it is so, so necessary to everything and it's still relevant today. Um, so starting there and then after that, really just trusting your gut and not being afraid to just kind of be on your own. Um, like that was something that I definitely had, like I'm trying to change within like this witchy world with like being so open with education and, and trying to put myself and like my faith and my culture out there more. But I had to learn that like, there's not a seat for me at every witchy table <laughs> and like, and that's okay. I don't have to make my, I don't have to diminish myself and my beliefs to try to fit into like this world that I may not be supposed to be a part of. And that was a very, very hard lesson that I wish I would have learned a lot sooner because it would have saved me like years of like terrible spiritual practice <laughs> of trying to like fit into something that just wasn't meant for me. And instead making something unique to you. Yeah, you make your own dang on table. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> so if somebody wanted has never reached out to an ancestor before, oh. where would, wh how would you tell them to start? Where did you start of like the very first day that they have no idea what they're doing, but they're like, you know what? I have decided this is important. So I'm going to blank. What should they do? Um. I would, first of all, like I was super, super lucky in my situation of that, like I said, with our, with our family still being in the exact same place we were like when we were brought to the States and then like indigenous wise, like being right there on the land. So like our family, like we have history books, we have names, we have everything like right here, which I know for most people in the diaspora, like that's not the case. So I would say to approach it just like any other relationship. And I think that's what's really important is that people have to recognize this is a relationship. So you don't just come to the ancestors like asking for things, you're cultivating a relationship. So starting off talking to them, being like, just, hey, <laughs> like, I'm here, I want to get to know you. <clears throat> I want you to be part of my life. Um, telling them like what it is specifically that you need of like, hey, I would like for you to guide me in this. And then these are the things that I can do for you. Um, like with leaving foods out, um, with fresh flowers, just like anything. It's just, it's cultivating any sort of relationship like you would with any sort of friend. Um, so just starting off at the basis of like, hey, like, like it really is that simple. Yeah, just, you know, saying hello. If you've never interacted with them before, just, you know, introducing yourself again. Yeah, not, I mean, yeah, so don't like start off being like, hey, this is what I need you to do for me. Like, when they don't know who the heck you are. So, like, yeah, just in spending time with them, I think what's important is like, it's the consistency, like I said, with any relationship that like every day you're spending time with them, that you're being like, hey, thank you for this, or this is what's going on in my life. Just like having a conversation every single day, though, not just coming like 
when you need something because we know how we feel with like relationships like that in our lives <laughs> when like there's that person that just comes to you whenever they need anything your ancestors have feelings too <laughs> like they don't want you to be that person and stuff for them so so yeah just cultivating a relationship have you something else that came up in, in questions about ancestor work is um have you come across any ancestors that don't want to work with you i have not personally again because ancestor work has just always been a huge part of my life and like i've been very aware of like which ones to mess with and which ones not to <laughs> and i think that's something that's really important that people have to understand on this journey and stuff too is it it's just like with any living relative that there are certain relatives that like i'm not gonna mess with um a lot of it has i mean like perfect example like with me be, with me being queer there are certain relatives that I'm like, mm, nope, <laughs> like we're not gonna, we're not gonna buy, we're not gonna have a relationship. Like you have certain like colonial type views on like my sexuality, so there's no reason for us to work together. It's like I love and honor you as an ancestor, and we're gonna leave it at that. Like I'm not going <laughs> to like try to develop a relationship. But like it's the same thing with me and anyone living that I'm just like you're my family and I love you from a distance and then that's it I'm not going to invite you into my home so the same thing with the ancestors <laughs> I'm not going to invite you into my home if you believe I'm an abomination you know so it's just like I have not had that experience thankfully because I just knew starting off like who not to mess with but that is something to be aware of and like and not to get discouraged of that like People put ancestors like on this, I won't say pedestal because I mean, they should be elevated, but they, they treat them as, as, as if it's this monolith of that, like all the ancestors, they've all got your back. They've all, and that's crap. They don't like, I mean, that's just the reality of like people, like they're not all going to have your back. There are some people that like, we see all the time, but like blood doesn't necessarily make you family. So that carries on like with ancestors. So like you have to recognize that there's some that you're just not going to mesh with. And like, that's okay. You just keep moving and like, you don't give up just like you don't give up in real life when like you meet one person that you don't vibe with. Yeah. I think a lot of people think that when someone passes on that they're like all of a sudden a great, wonderful person, all of their mistakes have been erased, all their personality has been erased, when really, a lot of times we find that ancestors are exactly the same in death that they were in life. On earth, yeah, <laughs> they're probably still crap when they get into the afterlife, so. Right, um, a lot of people believe that, you know, you sort of make your own reality in, in the afterlife, so you sort of are the same way that you were, so to expect somebody to completely change that, you know, if it was a great grandfather who absolutely hated gay people, it probably hasn't evolved in death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So reaching out to someone like that probably isn't going to get you the results that, that you're looking for. And it's just some things you just shouldn't take chances on, which I like, I mean, I believe in grace and second chances for like a lot of people and stuff so I don't want to say that people can't ever change but am I going to like build my spiritual practice around that no <laughs> like so I'm not like I mean I pray for you and I hope that you did change and you became a better person that's great for you in your life but I'm not going to like build like my spiritual practice around hoping that you changed yeah. And I think it's important to not get discouraged when you come across somebody like that in, in your ancestors or in practice in general. Especially like even in like the real, like material, like world, like here and stuff like on earth that you, if you are like setting off on a path, like you mentioned before, that's different than like what you've been accustomed to, especially, especially I feel within like the African diaspora, because we have lost through no fault of our own like we've been extremely colonized people and so we've lost so much of like our faith and our community and our spirituality so we're so conditioned to believe a certain way so if you 
are going off on your own path and like, or not your own path, but really just try to return to like the original path of like your ancestors, you're going to get a lot of hangouts from your family. You're going to get a lot of people that like whisper behind your back or like that are taking you to the altar at their church to like pray for you and stuff. So not getting discouraged by that, because that's where the importance of having a relationship with your ancestors comes in because you are able to hold on to that faith and hold on to that relationship of knowing that these are the people that have your back. Like you're not alone in this. You have people that are guiding you and pushing you and rooting you along. Yeah. I think that's important to know no matter where you are in your journey that you're not alone. And even if you're just starting out and it feels like the world is against you, that there, you are going to come across somebody, you know, in your life or in your ancestors that is going to have your back and be on the same page. You were definitely not out there all alone. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you chatting and talking all about um, your, your history and your practice and everything that you offer. I think that is incredibly interesting. And I know you're going to get a lot of, you know, reach out and questions from this. Um, so before I let you go, is there any last things that you would like to share? Um, I think the only thing would be next month, I am going to start offering virtual educational classes again. Um, like I took a break for a while to really like I was starting a lot with like opening the apothecary and I wanted to get into a rhythm like with that. And so now I feel like we're good. So next month I'm going to start classes again. And so like I usually do like two classes a month and they're always on like different topics. Like I've done um, things on like indigenous folklore. Like that's actually one of the first classes is on indigenous folklore. Um, I've done like herbal classes. I've done like just all types of classes about like my spirituality um, and like teaching people how to cultivate and develop those practices so I'm going to start those classes back next month so that's something I'm really excited about and if people have questions and want to learn things like that's a really good opportunity oh that sounds great what a fun offering <laughs> well it, yeah it goes back to like I said the thing about education is is super important so I I feel like I have been super blessed in having this family that has retained all this knowledge and all this information. And so I have an obligation to share that with other people. Um, and that's one of the things in terms of my relationship with my ancestors of that they have given me all these blessings. And so they've asked in return that like, I have to like pay this forward essentially. And so I have to listen, I have to be obedient to that. So. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story and all of your offerings. So once again, I am going to have all of her information linked on uh, whichwednesdays.com. So you can go check her out at all of her different places and different offerings um, to see what is available. And I think that is everything that we have for you for this week. And thank you again so much for being here. Thank you for having me. And everyone else, I will see you next week. Need even more? Subscribe to Patreon and YouTube for exclusive bonus content. Order a themed witchcraft box every month through Witch Wednesdays on Etsy. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Witch Wednesdays Podcast. Find all these links and more at witchwednesdays.com.